I'm Jerry McGinn. I'm the executive director for the Center of, for Government Contract in the School of Business at George Mason University. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar on COVID-19 and the implications for the government contracting community. Um, so the purpose of this webinar is threefold. First is to give you information to help navigate operating your business or government agency in this profoundly changed world. Secondly, to provide details on the COVID-19 response and how and the contract, contract implications of that federal response. And principally focus on the stimulus bill. And finally, to give you some ideas on how, how government contracting, your government contracting company or agency can help during this time. So to do that, we're very fortunate to have assembled a great panels, including um, uh, GovCon CEO, two attorneys, very uh, school um, educated in this world. And uh, what we'd like to do, start off with an introduction by our Dean, uh, by Dean Maury Piperell, then five to seven minutes of remarks from our panelists, and then uh, questions from you. Please submit your questions uh, through the Q&A feature on Zoom. See a couple have already come in, so please do it there so we can, uh, and we'll respond to those as we get to the, to the question and answer period. The, there's a slide, this slide deck will be sent to you afterwards. Um, so we, when we blow through some of the slides, uh, don't be afraid, uh, we can go back to them during the Q&A and you'll be able to see them as we go forward. But let me turn it over to Maury to get us, get us rolling. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you all for being here today. This is, um, in many in many ways, uh, a very difficult time for all of us. Uh, but in another way, uh, this is a very important day for George Mason University and the School of Business, and of course, the Center for Government Contracting. What we aim to do is to be out there convening the important dialogues that have to take place in the world of practice and inform them with the expertise that comes um, from being a, an academic institution that really cares about what happens in the day to day. And as so much is happening right now, uh, we, uh, we thought it was uh, absolutely spot on our mission to convene this conversation. And I'm very grateful to all of you uh, for joining us, especially for our panelists today. Mason is a place where uh, theory and practice come together, where business and government come together, uh, and where local, regional, and global come together. And, and we hope that you find that in the course of this afternoon's conversation. I want to thank uh, Jerry McGinn, who's, of course, the head of our uh, GovCon Center for gathering this uh, distinguished group of speakers, uh, and I hope that uh, you will find their uh, input valuable, both on the government side uh, and on the uh, contracting side. I also want to um, introduce, or uh, rather reintroduce, uh, John Hillen, who is uh, really the person behind the founding of our Government Contracting Center. He's well known uh, in industry uh, and also to our School of Business faculty, in particular our our uh, management and leadership students, especially our MBAs. And uh, we do credit him with that, uh, with that uh, founding of the center and thank him for his work uh, as he continues uh, to bridge, uh, not just being a CEO in industry, but also connecting those in, uh, in uh, government and in academia. Uh, Jeff Ballos is an expert on matters of direct importance to the Department of Defense. He has been Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Industrial Affairs. Uh, preceding uh, actually the appointment of Jerry McGinn and covering much the same subject matter. And if you haven't heard by now about the uh, Defense Production Act and Jerry's uh, former uh, oversight of that, which is much in the news, I'm sure you will in the course of this afternoon. I also want to thank uh, Jim Fontana, who has an extensive background, of course, in government and commercial contracts, uh, very diverse operational focus, lit litigation, ethics, corporate governance, M&A, uh, and uh, I want to thank him for his uh, early and long-standing dedication to building our uh, Center for Government Contracting and our school. Uh, and with that, I want to uh, wish you a, a very good uh, webinar. I will be back. We're on a conversation now uh, of the deans with the new president of Mason. Uh, so if you'll excuse me, I'm going to hop back and, and join you a little bit later. Super. Thanks, Maury. Uh, thanks for, for enabling us to have this webinar. And what I'm going to do is cover a couple of things up front, and then we'll um, then uh, transition to the panelists. So first off, um, um, the Defense Production Act, which before two weeks ago was a very uh, little known authority that came out of the Korean War. So there's some, uh, and I happen to have run that uh, authority in the Department of Defense or overseen it. Um, and so I have uh, quite a bit of information, uh, knowledge on that as does uh, Jeff Bialos, who uh, preceded me um, a few years. So um, you'll see on the right-hand side of the slide a number of links to articles and uh, things that we've done on that. Um, so, but I, I wanted to just 
take 30 seconds and talk about what it means today. So there's two aspects or two articles of the, the Defense Production Act that are relevant for the, this, uh, this uh, current crisis. The first has been the one that's in the news, is the ability of the federal government to rate and um, prioritize contracts. And the president did that with, the, um, uh, with his executive order back on March 18th to help kind of set the prioritization of uh, goods and, uh, that need to be uh, delivered at a certain time. The, the other part of that authority of that uh, title is has to do with the allocation of resources. This is the ability to uh, not take ownership but or nationalize, but to take uh, direct control over the, um, for instance, the ventilator business. Uh, and the president has is reluctant to use it, uh, has been heretofore reluctant to use it, but then just invoked it um, recently for uh, a piece to encourage GM to uh, can, uh, can produce more ventilators. So, and then the other aspect of, um, other title of the um, Defense Production Act you're gonna be hearing very, very soon is Title III, which is, gives the president the ability to uh, conduct grants, loans, purchases, purchase commitments, um, to um, invest in the, uh, the domestic industrial base to, for capacity building. It's currently being done in areas like rare earth um, uh, production, um, micro small UAVs, specialty chemicals and like, but you're gonna see there was a billion dollars in the stimulus bill. You're gonna see a lot of uh, DPA Title III projects coming out focused around the pharmaceutical healthcare supply chain. So that's Defense Production Act. Next slide. So the, um, and the other thing, the other reason why the center is involved is that the center, our, our, our mission of the center is to be a nexus for government industry and academia to address the business policy and regulatory issues facing overall government contracting. And so, um, so what we start here is looking at uh, the timeline of events. And the, the point of this slide is to show the ramp up in obligations. These are federal obligations, not including Department of Defense. Department of Defense obligations lag 90 days because of how they report. But as you can see, um, the response has ramped up significantly. We did a report, which I'll reference in the next page, um, on March 25th. At that point, we were about $250 million in obligations. And you can see we're almost, we're over a billion now um, counting today. So money is um, flowing um, at the federal levels uh, at, a, at, a, at a quite a clip going um, from here forward. Next. So the Senate report, uh, which we put on March 25th, you can get it here at, at this, through this link or on our website. Um, and it provides updates on these things. So I encourage you to take time and uh, review that. Uh, the lead author of that was one of our research fellows, Eric Lofgren, who'll be speaking shortly. Um, but this is, you know, this is very evolving, fast-moving situation, and we're we're already starting to update um, uh, the, the report, and we expect to do a regular updates. So next slide. The thing that my colleagues are going to talk about is how is this impacting your agency, your company. The government has put out some guidance and directives um, from OMB, from the Department of Defense, from the Department of Homeland Security. They've even changed how they make payments on contracts to help improve liquidity. And this also raises a lot of questions for prime subcontracts and the like. And I'm gonna let my colleagues handle those um, during their, during their um, time. So next. The initial response uh, for federal spending was these first two packages, which were done in early and mid-March, and those are fo principally focused on healthcare response, and you're starting to see those in the obligations that, that are um, happening today. But the real focus um, it, that what the President signed yesterday was this $2 trillion stimulus, largest ever um, federal expenditure uh, stimulus bill in, in history. And there are a couple components about it that are that are quite um, uh, quite interesting. The there's very targeted funds for uh, loans and loan guarantees to help commercial businesses, commercial airlines, and certain businesses critical to national security um, uh, to continue operations. But there are also significant uh, requirements and conditions for the for use of those funds. Um, if you look at the actual break, uh, not quite yet. Go back. So if you look at the actual breakdown of those funds, uh, most, uh, the vast majority were non-discretionary or direct payments. These are direct payments to individuals or business loans, hospitals, uh, unemployment, um, and unemployment uh, payments. Some of those loans are relevant for you know, small business administration loans and other loans for impacting contracting firms. Um, but the big piece um, is the supplemental in terms of 
the $20 billion for Veterans Health and $11 billion for HHS. There's, um, and then almost 10, um, $10.5 billion for Department of Defense. Uh, key for that is you've got a billion dollars in uh, Defense Production Act funds um, that were allocated, which is the largest by far ever, and um, uh, uh, $1.5 billion in work capital funds. And that's going to lead to a tremendous number of um, uh, opportunities for companies that want to help. Uh, one final point on um, is that this bill also reduced the um, um, lifted the caps on the using other transactions authority which is a way to get a rapid uh, prototype and get things on contract fast. Um, and HHS did not have the authority to do this before. So this, this bill extended that authority and also raised for the Department of Defense the caps the, the, um, for that uh, so that it can be used on larger scale projects. So we'll get into some of this further in, um, as we move on, but um, I will now wanna turn it over to Eric so he can discuss some of how we're seeing this lay down um, in, um, the contracts versus uh, current situation. So over to you, Eric. Thanks, Jerry. So we're going to take a quick look at some data before we turn it back to our panelists. So what we're looking at here is, uh, and the question we're trying to ask is, where is the distribution of contract obligations in general from the government? And how does that compare to the location of COVID-19 cases? So in the circles and the bubbles, you can see uh, dollar obligations by location. The blue is Department of Defense. Again, because there's a lag, we're using data from the previous year. Um, the gray is uh, for all other agencies besides the DOD. And so you can kind of see that where the COVID cases hit the hardest in New York, there tends not to be as many government contracts. And in Seattle, where there's a, a little bit of an issue, and in New England, there's a good bit of uh, DOD contracts. Um, we can move on to the next slide. So this is basically the same uh, kind of idea here, but we're only going to be looking at HHS and FEMA over time. So you can see here in purple HHS obligations and blue is FEMA. And we're now into March and here come the COVID cases and they're starting to grow very rapidly. So um, that's just a little over time view of, of coronavirus cases really starting to ramp up here in the, in the past couple of weeks and what's happening to obligations. We'll be look, looking at that and tracking that going forward. Uh, next slide. So another question is whether uh, coronavirus is actually leading to a decrease in the overall obligations coming out of the, DO, um, out of the government. And again, the DOD has the reporting lag, so we're looking at everything except DOD here. Highlighted in orange is the month of March. Um, these things tend to be cyclical. You can see some of the gray spikes. That is the year end September. So a lot of government agencies obligating dollars. But what we're seeing for this past month up through the 27th, so it's not even a complete month, it's about average relative to the inflation adjusted historicals. So we're not seeing a huge impact yet, but we might want to start cutting and slicing that in different ways and see what the trends are um, kind of day to day. And we'll be tracking that going forward. Next slide. And finally, we have obligations um, directly tied to the COVID-19 response. Uh, you can see on the left, the, we categorized the spending into major buckets. Research and development was by far the largest, and that was actually taking taking advantage of other transactions. So more than half of the total obligations for COVID are for research and development using other transactions contracts. Uh, but then we see a breakdown of the PPE, which is uh, personal protective equipment. We have ventilators there at 30. Again, DOD obligations are not reported here. So the DOD actually put on about an $80 million um, obligation for ventilators that's not being reported here. This is everything except for Department of Defense. And um, on the right, you see the obligations by location. And again, these obligations have been growing fast, as Jerry said. So if the current trend continues, potentially in a couple of weeks, we'll be uh, north of 100 billion in obligations for COVID, um, given the growth rates that have been going on. Uh, back to you, Jerry. Sure, one final slide, uh, and this is um, what, um, there's a lot of different, um, through uh, beta.sam.gov, a lot of opportunities that are coming um, out, uh, they've grown significantly. We did our, we highlighted these in our report last week, and since then, 
the numbers have ramped up um, tremendously. So you'll see the the types of response, upper, the types of contract opportunities and the needs are very tremendously. They're from PPE uh, to ventilators to other kind of the emergency or deployable field hospitals, um, the prototypes, the like. They and the agencies involved are you know span from HHS, Department of Veterans Affairs, DOD, FEMA, and um, and, and Department of Interior. Initially, a lot of them were in the sources side phase, which is the earliest phase of procurement, you know, identifying sources uh, where, you know, government agencies were looking for, okay, I know my uh, 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 traditional providers, but who else is out there? So there were some of those, but then now you're starting to see as you get to the bottom of the list uh, that they're just going straight to solicitations, which is actually looking to procure through um, requests for proposals or requests for quotes. And these are happening tremendously um, uh, quick turns. They're publishing uh, they're publishing um, uh, notices um, on one day, requiring responses the next, um, and th this is this is just going to accelerate. So I would encourage you um, if you were. Um, and, and the other thing I wanted to, to outline is it's not just you know healthcare and PPE companies. You've got companies that do um, deployable um, uh, medical work with Department of Defense and Special Operations Command or other um, other agencies that do deployable health things. Their tremendous will be opportunities, their capabilities can bring to bear. And also companies that do prototypes, 3D printing um, can also um, um, have opportunities. And you've seen this too, they're like one of the, solic the solicitations is about doing prototypes for ventilators or other equipment. Uh, and that has a quick turn from the Department of Defense. And that, you know, I was speaking with a company that is in the space business that was looking to do prototypes in that. So there are a number of different opportunities um, to help to, for companies that want to help. Um, again, this just covers um, uh, federal spending, but the opportunities there are significant. And, um, you know, I think we're going to, what we intend to do is to keep following this as a center um, to see what, what contract vehicles work um, most effectively are, and are able to get the most dollars through and, and we'll uh, uh, hopefully highlight that in upcoming uh, reports. So um, that's um, the top level review for your consideration. And now I'd like to turn it over to my, uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. John Hillen, who um, um, has written a good piece in uh, Washington Technology and is fighting this on the front line, so to speak. So John. Great. Uh, thank you, Jerry, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do when we started the Center for Government Contracting in the Business School at George Mason was to have yet another place where the community could mobilize, and in this case, uh, you could add in the dimension of academic research and a distinctive competency of a business school in this uh, half a trillion dollar year industry. And uh, so uh, it's been great to see that blossom uh, with the help of many people, many of whom are on these uh, on the panel today, uh, getting that underway. And, and it was precisely these kinds of situations in which you need that fellowship, that grouping of people and the application of research to it. Um, so let me highlight one dimension of this. It's parochial. I run a mid-sized uh, defense and intelligence technology services firm. This is the fifth one that I've done throughout the course of my career. And uh, so that's my perspective today coming at this. But I've also been the chairman of the Professional Services Council, the trade industry group for government contractors, and, um, and represented the industry in addition to having been uh, the customer as a senior government official for some pieces of this throughout the course of my career. And so what I highlighted in my Washington Technology piece last week was at the highest level, the concept, the task, the requirement of our nation to uh, understand its technology workforce that does especially uh, solutions and technology services and professional services that require a national security clearance of some kind or the other. That workforce is, of course, composed of broadly two kinds of people, federal government uh, officials, career, uh, or even temporary federal government employees, and then contractors. In many cases, especially as you move towards the more technological end of the spectrum, the contractors far outnumber their federal customers. It may be nine to one in terms of uh, technology expertise and services. It may be even more than that. Sometimes on a large program, 
with hundreds of contractors, so there's only two or three federal government people represented, and they're mostly there to make sure that it's being well run, the application of federal funds to the program and everything are, are in place, and they do that in concert with the prime contractor. So when the mission customer in the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, the FBI, the intelligence community, any national security agency looks out at their workforce, they really are seeing a total workforce that has two dimensions, the federal civil servants and then the contractors. And over the course of the past 20 years, with these stops and starts we'd have in work in this space and other federal government work, mostly due to budget imbroglios, but now due to the impact of COVID-19 and having to take steps to respond to the medical requirements in and around it, especially social distancing. Um, over the all those stops and starts over the past two decades, um, we've treated one work one part of that workforce differently than the other part. And we now have in place, and happily so, a series of essentially guarantees for the federal civil servants in this workforce that when they can't work for whatever reason, there's three weeks with no funding because we're in a, a budget imbroglio on the Hill, or they're prevented from getting to their site by the rules of social distancing and our coronavirus response. But when they can't work, they're not going to lose money. Their career is not going to be stymied. They're not going to have to dip into um, their, uh, their vacation time or take time off without pay or those sorts of things. But we didn't do that for contractors until a couple of days ago when a provision a temporary provision, I think it runs out at the end of this year, was put in the CARES Act that does that for contractors. And that's good to see because what has happened over the past couple of years is when we have work stoppage on federal contracts, a lot of times the contractors just have to stay home or go home, especially if they work on sites that have restricted access and then are now thinning out their workforce by moving to shifts or declaring some people non-essential and telling them not to come in. And this workforce, uh, as a result of those work stoppages, budget issues before COVID-19 now, is becomes treated like day laborers in many ways. Um, these are highly trained professionals um, with uh, exquisite technology skills that are hard to get and rare security clearances. And yet they are basically <laughs> being treated as day laborers that can be picked up or dropped off depending on what the need is on the day. In the meantime, companies like mine promise them a career, career progression, uh, a long uh, career in the space. And uh, we already know we work contract by contract. We compete for those. We start when the contract starts. We end when the contract ends. The, but to be taken off of it in the middle of it, for whatever reason, in this case, coronavirus response, and told, you have to stay home, you can't bill, you can't make money on it, even though the contract's fully funded and you were awarded this work, um, completely disrupts the workforce. The last couple of times we went through this in budget crises, a lot of the workforce just left, especially when the, the rest of the economy is doing pretty well. They just left and they don't come back. It's, uh, it's a lot of steps. It can be very intrusive to go through a multi-year process to get security clearances. It's even more steps to become trusted by unique and interesting customers in the national security space. And once somebody goes off of doing some work for the National Reconnaissance uh, uh, organization and then goes to Apple, they, they tend not to come back, uh, just to give one example. So um, for the first time with this legislation only a few days ago, um, we're starting to see um, at least Congress at this point giving the federal procurement man, the federal program managers and those that manage our procurement system some tools, not all the tools they need to be able to manage the entirety of their workforce and essentially keep both parts of their workforce, their federal government employees and their cleared technology or professional services contractors in place and at the ready and being paid for the work that they're contracted for and want to do, but may be prevented from in a temporary situation. So I was very happy to see that, but there's still a lot of detail to work through and how that is applied. And in the meantime, the really important thing is that um, there needs to be some recognition in the federal government that somebody's in charge of this workforce, not just program by program. Because when you go program by program, program managers may make decisions that are smart for their program at the time, but in the long run hurt the viability 
of this very precious workforce that is assembled slowly and over time and that needs to be kept in readiness at all times. So we're making some progress there, but, but there's still some work to do. Jeff, you're up. Go ahead and unmute, and you're, you're up. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, first of all, pleasure to be here today with you all in these really challenging times. Um, let me just say, um, uh, I come at this from several perspectives. Um, first, I was, uh, as Jerry said, a predecessor in the office in DOD, where I was deputy on the Supreme Defense for Industry, and Defense Production Act was, you know, under my uh, jurisdiction, and I worked with it. Second of all, I was a member of Virginia's Homeland's advisory panel for a number of years uh, and, and coming to some preparedness uh, standpoint. Third of all, these days, I'm a partner at Evershed Sutherland, which is a global law firm. And I'll just a two minute, two second advertisement to say we have people, uh, the teams of people all over the world looking at the implications of COVID for defense, aerospace, aviation, and other industries. And it's it's daunting and it's differentiated by country to some degree, but there are enormous issues. I mean, people do employment tax, um, all sorts of information, <coughs> and, you know, you should go uh, to our website. We have a COVID um, website with lots of resources and materials on that uh, there. So, um, so I want to touch on a couple things today. Uh, first on the, uh, the fabled Defense Production Act, which is Jerry said I have to laugh about because you know, probably only 10 people know too much about it in the country. And now I hear everybody talking about it on TV as if it's their best friend. Um, but look, there's a difference between authorizing the use of the Defense Production Act and actually using it in practice. And what has happened largely to date, it's been the president first authorized the use of titles one of it, which is the um, priorities and allocations Authority, Jerry mentioned. Uh, today, this very day, there was an executive order that came out authorizing the use of the other authorities, Title III, which covers loans and other incentives to business to uh, enhance capabilities uh, in a time of emergency, and Title VII, which allows industry wide agreements of various kinds that might not normally violate the antitrust laws. Although I'm not sure how they'll be needed here. Um, the issue has been. Uh, the administration has really exhibited a stubbornness, uh, a stubborn, sustained refusal to use it. They've invoked it in one situation, apparently. We don't know too much about it, but it's really been sort of allergic to that. Um, you know, and, and I have to say, um, you know, the president said we, first we said we'd use it for a worst case only. Uh, you know, that to me is today public policy malpractice. It's sort of head scratching and self defeating. Because it's the DPA and the use of the DPA combined with contracting authority and budget authority um, that can get you out of this faster by surging and helping develop the capabilities in place uh, so that six months, eight, 18 months from now, um, we have enough hospital beds, we have all the things we need, so we can be more comfortable sending people back to work and, and reopening. And so what, it needs, what needs to happen, and I think people miss this point, um, it, it's not a matter of one-offs. And, and by the way, uh, it's not a good policy. You don't have a good industrial mobilization policy when the White House economics advisor is calling Haynes underwear. Um, I, volunteerism by industry is great, um, you know, but it's not going to get us out of this. Um, and I think the, 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 it's been curious because the Chamber of Commerce, for example, wrote a memo saying that um, they oppose the use of the DPA and they've made arguments that just have little or no merit. I mean, for example, they said it might violate our WTO obligations under the government procurement code. Well, the last time I read the WTO as a former trade official and lawyer, uh, I can tell you there's an essential security provision that allows you to exempt yourself from that. They also suggested this would disrupt global supply chains. To the contrary, it would help the situation because what we need is volume of production. Um, you know, it's not a matter of disrupting existing chains. We need more volume, period. Um, and so I'm puzzled by these, our, sort of these, these almost ideological arguments against it. And again, don't get me wrong, volunteerism is great. It's not going to solve it. What they have to do here, in my judgment, 
um, is a systemic holistic approach, putting together these tools under the DPA, all of its sections, with our contracting authority, the people at FEMA and DOD who did quick contracting during wartime, uh, you know, and the people who know this industry, and have to take a systematic look at this, what you do is, and, and maybe part of the problem here is the government has no institutional memory, Republican or Democrat doing this, because we haven't done anything like this in 40, 50 years. Um, what you need to do is put together a team of people, quickly do a survey, I mean, two-day two turnaround for getting information from the directly affected industries, understand what the companies can and can't do, what their flexibility is. Maybe there's a company making one kind of mask today, the three kinds of masks, and it should only be making N95 masks. Well, we can do something to incentivize that here today. The company may have other reasons why they're uh, doing their production, some things that aren't relevant to uh, coronavirus, uh, to COVID. Um, the DPA can be used not just as a, a hammer, but you know, to incentivize people to make those kinds of decisions. Second of all, we need the surge capability uh, and, and build a stockpile. How do you do that if you're at your limit of capability? Well, um, maybe some of the companies who are the main companies making this today could quickly put together a second line. The government can use its Title III authorities to help facilitate that. Um, and, and if the industry that's the primary industry that makes masks or makes many ways can't do it, then you move to the next closest substitute. Maybe medical supply companies that already know how to meet healthcare requirements. I mean, I hear talk of automotive companies that could do this, and that's great. But the reality is that there's a long lead time to companies to making medical devices. And we ought to go from the in a disciplined way from the main industry to the nearest substitutes and so forth to get there quickly and the most affordable. And I just don't see a systematic holistic effort. It's just not happening. And I think it's tragic because again, it's not onesie twosie. It's using these authorities overall. And, and again, I don't necessarily mean you're going to order people around to do things, but the combination of these authorities and the fact that the government can order people and the prospect of ordering them should help bring people to the table. Um, a second point I wanted to touch on is these federal guidelines, which I mentioned at the beginning. Um, you know, here we have the dialogue between, if you will, the, the federal guidelines on who's a critical infrastructure industry and state orders, which are changing every day. Maryland just put a, a stay-at-home order in place this morning, if you didn't notice it. And, you know, for a while, the companies have been struggling with that. And to address that, what's, what's critical? The defense company is critical, Homeland Security is company is critical, et cetera. DOD put out two memos. One was by uh, uh, CISA, which is the, um, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency of DHS. And then DO, DOD uh, dovetailed. The CISA memo basically says that, you know, uh, broad swaths of the economy, if you will, in these uh, security-related areas and infrastructure-related areas, um, uh, are essential and it has a six or seven page, seven page list of these things which people need to look at. It's not just defense, not just homeless security, it's things in food and agriculture, transportation, logistics and other things. It does mention the defense industrial base and the DOD memo by Undersecretary Lord keyed off that and defined the defense industrial base basically to cover um, firms that design, develop, produce, maintain, do logistics, foreign services to support a federal contracts to meet security needs. Now, the important thing is these memos are not legally binding. These would issue to give guidance to the states who are issuing these orders within the scope of their authority. Uh, and so the fact that you have, uh, you're mentioned in, in, in the federal guideline and you're within it doesn't necessarily get you out of it. The DOD memo, I will say, while it's clear it's advisory, does essentially um, go out there a little bit and say that companies aligned with critical infrastructure are expected to maintain their normal work schedules. I think that's their way of lobbying the states. And indeed, what you see is uh, since these guidelines came out, some of the newer state orders, uh, the Indiana order, for example, and others have keyed off the DOD and DHS memo and created those exemptions. But not all the states have done that by any means. And just to give you a quick uh, thing locally, uh, Virginia doesn't have a stay-at-home order, and it's only closed non-essential retail places, so that means defense companies can operate freely. Maryland issued a stay-at-home order, which is, has a definition of essential uh, uh, businesses that is much more limited than the one it had previously, but it had its own definition that was quite broad, um, but it does include everybody on the federal list. 
the federal guidelines on Homeland Security and Defense. DC, Washington DC closed non-essential businesses. It refers to the CISA memo, but frankly, it's kind of confusing. And it doesn't read the media, it applies to the defense industrial base. So it's not a model of clarity there. Pennsylvania has a county by county uh, order. It, it applies to a number of counties. It's a, uh, a stay at home order. Um, it now says that aerospace production products and manufacturing should be closed except defense industrial base and transportation manufacturing under the CISA order. So in Pennsylvania, there's some dialogue that the companies are calling in questions about this. And by the way, if you have questions about any things we're talking about, you know, please do feel free to reach out uh, to us because chances are if I don't have it, one of my 2,000 colleagues is looking at it. Um, you know, one of the questions people ask me, I'll just throw out there is, what happens if only some of your business is covered in it? You have a plant where it's 50-50. Um, you know, I think it's going to be fact specific in, uh, in that situation. What happens if you can't get certain key personnel to come in, uh, then what do you do? Um, third point I want to mention briefly, uh, is deep pass rated orders. A lot of defense companies have what are called rated orders that are given priority over others. And when this crisis broke, some of the primes wrote these notes saying, just a reminder of supplier base, you have rated orders. The implication being you have to, you know, perform under them. Well, it's, it's, life is not that simple. Um, so what happens if there's a hole in your supplier base, somebody doesn't have the materials, their people don't come to work in, they shut down and create a problem for you. Or what happens if you have a state order that sends your orders you to shut down? Two points. Um, the official Commerce Department view is there is a notice in the rated order rules. There is a provision in the rated order rules, the DPAS rules, the defense priorities rules, that basically says, um, you know, if this kind of situation happens uh, and you have a rated order and you subsequently find you can't ship it on, on time, you notify the customer for the reasons for the delay and you give them a um, uh, you know, and you advise that, uh, of a new date if you can. Uh, now, you can't do that alone. You probably have to invoke force majeure or some provision under the, uh, you know, under, under contracts land. It would probably be the excusable delay provision of the FAR gym. I think we'll talk about that. Uh, but that's not the only answer. If you do want to produce, and you can produce, and you're faced with a state order, you know, you need to understand there is a provision in the DPS rules that says um, uh, he who uh, uh, does perform and consistent with uh, acts in accordance with the DPS orders uh, can't be held liable for damages or penalties. Now, this probably wasn't designed for this situation. It was designed for, you know, if you uh, couldn't meet a commercial contract and the penalty clause was invoked because you were meeting a rating order for a defense uh, uh, system. Uh, but there's no law that's tested this, and it's an argument that can be used. Last point I want to make, and then I'll uh, turn it over is, uh, and we have a memo, and it's on, uh, if you go to the page with me in the PowerPoint, it's the third one, but we put out a, a very user-friendly roadmap yesterday for obtaining, uh, you know, financial assistance under the, the CARES Act, the stimulus package, and I think a lot of people can be very interested in that, and there are, in particular, three targeted areas that I think are really relevant to this community. One, there's up to $25 billion for passenger airlines, uh, repair companies and overhaul companies, uh, two, uh, four billion for cargo companies, and three, up to 17 billion for businesses, national, uh, critical and national security. Now, uh, that category is not further defined. Treasury and data will flesh that out because it has to do so in 10 days. It was added late. That's designed to include, uh, you know, if you will, companies like Boeing and its supply chain who, while they are defense providers, are going to be severely impacted by this because of their, so much of their business is on the uh, commercial side. Uh, you know, and I would say, you know, one question you asked me, can pure play defense companies benefit from this law? And I would say it's going to be tough because, you know, there are a series of conditions to get this, these specially targeted types of assistance. You know, one of them is that you have to have covered losses, meaning you know, the business is in jeopardy as a consequence of COVID. And if you're a pure play defense company operating in the corners, I don't think your customer is cutting you down and it's going to be hard to, be more challenging to invoke that. So the companies that are so-called do use uh, easier. But let me, the, the last point I want to make is that these targeted types of aid, there was a heavy negotiation about these categories I mentioned. Um, and, and they have come with real conditions. 
Um, there are limits when you get this money, these loans, loan guarantees. Uh, there's limits on your ability to reduce supply, uh, limits on your ability to make stock buybacks or issue dividends, and an executive compensation. And finally, there's a requirement that the U.S. Get government gets an equity position or, uh, in the case of non-public traded companies, or our senior debt position. Um, you know, I saw one company might not want to use these programs uh, because of some of that. And I think a lot of companies can have to make decisions and if they're life or death, obviously they'll probably take it. There are other uh, people who are eligible, other entities, businesses outside those distressed sectors that are eligible, where frankly, some of the requirements are more flexible and the conditionality is more flexible. And again, this was, uh, it's not necessarily rational, it's because it was a negotiated solution more than anything else. There's provisions for small business, there's for mid-size, and there's for other sectors. So people should take a look at this and see if their business is affected by, by the CARE Act. I mean, this is an option for people, but it's not for everybody. And with that, let me turn it back over to Jerry. I'm gonna uh, jump in and <clears throat> ask the panelists a question. I'm monitoring the chat. And uh, one of the things that just happened, I think when we were even prepping for the meeting is that Governor, Governor Northam did just issue a stay at home order for Virginia. Uh, and the chat is saying it's going until June 10th. Um, so something for us to consider. And then obviously friend of Mason and, and friend of the webinar, Sumit Srivastava. Uh, in some scenarios, we found the government being a little slower to accommodate virtual work and delivery may be impacted. Are there any provisions in the FAR that allow relief contractually and financially for that delivery impact? Uh, we might get to this in, in later ones. I just wanted to kind of throw out the immediate news of the stay-at-home order. All right, Jim, maybe you can answer that in your remarks, uh, and then we'll get to Q&A. So, thanks. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope you're staying safe. Um, I'm going to uh, attack this, go down, uh, drill down a little bit more uh, in, in detail, uh, because I think a lot of people are asking, now what? Now what do I do with all this stuff going around? I'm going to try to uh, talk about what's going on in terms of uh, uh, the government and directives they put out and the advisories, what I think is really going on, what I'm hearing from clients. Um, if you start with the uh, Ellen Lord uh, memo that uh, Jeff alluded to, and the quote, which really comes right out of the White House, says, if you work in a critical infrastructure industry, that's basically the defense industrial base, uh, almost everything defense related, you have a special responsibility to maintain your normal work schedule. Uh, okay. And I, I expect that the civilian agencies, the IC community, uh, the intelligence community have the same expectations. Um, you could look at a couple of uh, articles I've written for Washington Technology to, to get more of the details, but uh, what, what was alluded to here and in the article is the March 20th OMB memo uh, that basically says or encourages agencies uh, to permit telework that uh, allow flexibility in terms of contract management to include uh, providing equitable adjustments and the third there were three. The third one was to use, utilize the emergency uh, procurement authority. Uh, you have two DOD, what they call class deviations. They're basically deviating from the federal acquisition regulation, the FAR. One of them has to do with the justification and approval of what they call JNAs uh, for 8A companies. Uh, now it's up to uh, $100 million. The, the ceiling was $22 million. Um, and they've raised progress payments uh, for large businesses from 80 to 90 percent and from 85 to 95 percent uh, for small businesses. Um, you heard about today the CARES Act and, and the big takeaway there is that, that the agencies may, and I underscore may, modify contracts to allow for uh, a certain uh, paid leave. Um, that goes through um, September 30th uh, of this year. Um, so now what, um, you know, the, the government employees and the contractor employees, uh, they're in the same boat, but not necessarily in the same ocean. First thing to take away from these is that these are not legally binding. And I, uh, I'm old enough that I've, I've advised contract, I'm a government contracts lawyer or advised clients through about four shutdowns. This is analogous to a shutdown. I wouldn't call it really the same. 
Um, but I, it's the same thing in the beginning is that agencies may say, look at the guidance, we're going to follow the guidance. But, you know, the government people, they have their own beans to count. That may or may not happen. I'd like to be an optimist, but there could be some, some implications uh, to government contractors. Uh, it could devastate some businesses, especially the small businesses. Um, so you, you might have to use the changes clause or the delays clause or any of the, the government delays clause um, uh, or the excusable delays clause uh, that are in the FAR. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're not that simple to follow. Um, there are certain notice requirements that you have to be uh, uh, mindful of. Um, you, you have to also be mindful that there could be an implication of the change clause. I'm rattling off all these FAR clauses without giving you the numbers, uh, but these are different clauses that can come into play to help contractors deal uh, with uh, price adjustment, cost adjustment issues, depending on your, your contract type, uh, that may come up later on. Again, these agencies put out these, uh, I think, useful uh, and compelling uh, and quite generous uh, advisories. Um, but that doesn't mean that agencies may or may not fight them. And I, talking to uh, our colleagues in, in the government, we understand that you've, uh, you've got higher ups to look at, you have your budgets to look at. Um, everything in terms of what causes a delay is very fact specific. It's not gonna be the same for everybody. And I wanna address the telework issue uh, in particular, um, because it's it, people working at home um, have their own challenges that agencies may not see. Agencies, as I said before, they have an expectation that contractors, even if they're teleworking, and even in these tough times, will still meet the deliverables, will still meet the schedules, will still perform on a timely basis. Um, it's not as simple as that. I, the three things that I, um, I, I've talked to clients about, and, and the, one of the things that, that's come up the most is that you may be teleworking, but think of uh, a, um, a person who is a government contractor, they're working at home, they have kids, the daycare center is closed. That's a, that's a tough challenge. Um, to put the hours in, to meet the requirements, not only the, the company requirements, but the government requirements, and risking either that they might be laid off because they're not meeting the requirements, or there might be a stop work order, or there might be a default termination. So that's a particular thing that uh, we, we, might, we might run into uh, on, a, on, a, uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, the other one, I had one company say to me, we have uh, about a dozen or so employees that we want, to, that we were going to uh, deploy to Japan, I think it was, um, and uh, we don't want to send them because we don't want the liability. Um, and there was one client that had an issue with a number of employees in, in Korea in an area that was hardest hit. Of course, the whole country was hardest hit very hard uh, hit in, in Korea. Um, a number of employees asking for astronomical things like mask, hazmat suits, hazard pay, that kind of thing. So the, these issues are gonna be um, ongoing. Um, I would look at your contracts, look at your subcontracts. Uh, it's particularly with the subcontracts on the commercial side, they're called force majeure. Um, and on the government side, that's the excusable delay clause. Uh, where it has in there one of the excusable delays, one example of it is uh, epidemics, and I think this would fall into it. But it, it, it gets a little tricky because it has, still has to be without the fault of the contractor. And so there is an epidemic, but what happens if the work falls behind? Is it because of, of the pandemic here? Is it because of something else? And we may have some contractual and legal issues going forward. Um, Jerry, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, great. Um, so uh, Brett Justin, who directs our executive development program and is a professor in, the, in marketing, is going to, he's been monitoring the Q&A, and I'll turn over to him to uh, throw out the first couple of questions. All right. Uh, first, and if we want to get back to the Sumit's question, or if anybody else on the panel wants to take a stab at Sumit's, and then we'll go, so John, um, and then we'll go to some of the other uh, good ones. And, and to the uh, participants, remember, you can either do it in the Q&A or in the chat. I'll try to continue to um, monitor these and get them in front of the panelists. Yes, so on Samit's question, which is about um, what if your government customer is not really 
affording your people the opportunity to telework or it's just not d- doable because they work on a, a, a cleared site or on cleared systems or something along those lines. And, um, or it is doable, but customers are just slow to accept the work plans you should have submitted by now saying, here's how we can demonstrate move this program forward, even working at home, even working on class, even working off site. That's something every good company should be doing is proactively putting in front of the customer um, ways to, um, within the statement of work, move the work forward without being there. Some, it's still going to be hard. And here's where I think Jim's exactly right about the aspects of the law. And here's where a relationship with the customer and the primes if you're a subcontractor is so critical because the only thing that the legislation, the DOD and OMB guidance and any other agency guidance um, or anything else has come out does really is it gives top cover. It, it's, there are a series of things that give top cover to the government program managers, the, the contracting officer representatives, the contracting officers to work with the contractors under the terms of their contract or under expanded terms of the contract, which the legislation and some of the guidance alludes to being able to be creative uh, within those terms. It just gives you the chance to start that process and start that dialogue. For a lot of government customers, um, they won't see a huge amount of profit for themselves or for their programs in taking risks. And they may be reluctant to, even though they have top cover from these regulations. So um, uh, they'll need to be really talked to and worked with in the course of this in order to get them to be uh, more uh, virtual work, telework, and uh, off-site work oriented, either now or in the long term, catching up hours to the contracts to get it done. I still think there will be, at the end of the day, across the community, a lot of lost hours, a lot of unrecoverable work. And that's where I think everybody would be well served to have a Jim Fontana or Jeff Belos or somebody like that in their corner to help work the inevitable equitable adjustments and other things that will need to be done on the backside of this. Uh, If I can add a little bit uh, on this, um, look, there's no one size fits all. Companies can have different situations. So, you know, company A, most of the companies, uh, the the government orders, the way I read them, in the federal level, essentially say full speed ahead. Uh, You know, we'd like you to keep working in these areas, and it's a big bunch of areas. And the challenges companies face is, Again, as I said, well, first of all, maybe somebody in the supply chain doesn't have what they need. And without whatever is in that supply chain, you can't produce. Or what I've heard happening in the company that told me is happening is so they can't, uh, employee A, B, and C won't come in. And they're sort of a critical link. You know, and they may have some degree of uh, redundancies to cover that situation, but not much. So if you have somebody who's an employee in your you know, and your production chain is critical and they can't show up, you've got a problem. Um, and then, of course, you have what, uh, what John mentioned, the situation with the government, where the customer may not be, you know, yet sensitive to the problem. And the fact that a lot of people want to stay at home. Their kids are at home. It's very challenging. They may have somebody vulnerable at home. And what do you do? Well, the one thing you can do in some of those situations, people have you know, written force majeure letters to their customers. It's not optimal, but it's a kind of a wake up call a little bit. So you send it to your contracting officer that you're gonna, you may need to invoke excusable delay. And you say, look, I'm, I'm trying not to do this, but we need you to work with me. And it's maybe a way of encouraging a little more uh, movement along the line of uh, let us tell the community where we can, et cetera. You know, and I think people need to think about doing things like that. Um, there are a range of different authorities out there, though. It really is going to be very fact specific. I, I want to get to this question from uh, from Dan. Uh, if you have displaced workers, uh, what's one of the best ways to find companies that are hiring, especially rapidly um, cleaning companies, manufacturers, so that they can try to find places for their folks right away so they can make their ends meet?
pregnant pause. John, I think John maybe had a. <laughs> um, what? Well, that's that's a. I mean, that's a good question. I think uh, it depends on the workforce, right? That's, that's so highly dependent. Uh, um, and uh, right now, I've been encouraged to see in places that have called for workers. Um, they're overwhelmed with volunteers and other things. But for the most part, I think what we're talking about in this workforce, I'm not just talking about people with, you know, crypto mathematicians with seven weird clearances. I'm just talking about uh, um, your government, uh, professional administrative uh, workers, people in the aerospace and defense industry. They're probably not going to, um, want to go or go somewhere else and that's the whole idea behind a lot of this legislation is keep that workforce intact and not leaving to do something else even to make ends meet there may be others down at the um at, at a different level of services where they can do that and come straight back um in in certain service categories and i i, I think that may be useful but it's a very much you know by industry by service category thing i'm trying to get my people are mostly technology workers and highly qualified just to not give up on the government because this kind of stuff happens to it. Thankfully, they can look out there into the rest of commercial America and not see anything much better, right? Including a lot of industries that are really, really suffering as a result of our response to this, uh, to this crisis. So um, I think that's a real a case by case thing. And if, if you're in a critical skill area in the government services business, I would do everything you can to take advantage of this legislation and these tools that government officials have given their program managers to keep your workforce intact and hail and at the ready for when all these restrictions are lifted. That's great. Uh, I think this would go to all the panelists, but um, if you looked at the, the care uh, package that was just care packages, the uh, the care that was just signed, uh, is, is that set up in phases such that medical and physical needs are addressed first? This question comes from Dave. Uh, and then other areas such as cybersecurity, business health will follow or are the funds available right from the beginning? I mean, yeah, these that's a good question. I mean, the funds are available as, as soon as they're, you know, as, as the, the agencies obligate them. The president, they had the funds now, the president signed the legislation. So now it's up to the the agencies to put out solicitations uh, to get them on contract or use existing solicitations. So um, that there, I don't see any real phases. If, if what you're talking about is under the CARE Act, there are different colors of money, if you will. Um, what they've said is the payments to individuals who qualify in the means of the test, those checks should be out in the mail in three weeks. Um, the, the money for business is a $500 million fund where those sectoral amounts I mentioned come from, but I'm sorry, not million, $500 billion fund from which the sectoral amounts I mentioned come from, um, you know, the uh, airlines and others. Uh, and there's also, um, you know, money for small business. Those things will take a little more time because the government has to set up programs to dispense that money. Uh, the Treasury has 10 days to come up with guidelines for it, and presumably they will start doing that. Uh, for the mid-sized companies, the idea is Treasury is going to have uh, uh, essentially set up a program that, through direct loan programs with financial institutions, because Treasury is not set up to make you know, many, many loans to mid-sized companies. So presumably all that's going to take a few weeks at least to sort out, I would guess. And the SBA, they're geared up to make small loans, so it may be a little faster. Great, uh, I wanna to move to a question from Alan. What are the active and reactive postures companies should adopt in this current environment? I'll just chime in real fast. I, the active posture I mentioned, um, just a bit ago, at least I'm on the kind of business like I'm involved in, is get out in front of this and make it easy on your customer. So if your customer is searching for both top cover in terms of that legislation and that guidance, but also what I'll call bottom cover, which is a set of work plans that would really justify letting people who've never worked anywhere but in, you know, building 16 do their work outside of building 16, and this is a kind of unheard of, unthinkable sort of thing, before they even ask, Put in front of them work plans 
that uh, very systematically and with analytical rigor justified doing the work not in Building 16. Um, and in accordance with the contract, in accordance with the objectives, in accordance with all that. Now, there's primes, there's subs, there's workflows, there's work teams, there's all that that's got to be worked through. But that's one example of uh, proactive. Uh, I think the second set of things is on the, the kind of leadership aspect of this for institutional leaders is staying in front of those, your employees. Even today, while we're on this webinar, the Virginia governor and many of us Virginia based have Virginia based companies issues a stay at home order. What does that mean? You know, they're now going to be hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of employees. Does that affect me? How does it affect me? How do they know I'm essential? Do I have a, a little, little essential U.S. badge, you know, a little tin badge that says I'm essential personnel? What kind of letters do I need? Those sorts of things. So I think um, working with, uh, especially if your firm's not big enough to have your own general counsel, your own HR person, working with great outside uh, consultants there, just to stay ahead of communicating with employees because um, they'll always have more questions and you'll be able to answer. So staying ahead of that and staying ahead of your customers by making it easy on them to get to yes um, and teleworking. I think those are the two best proactive things you can do. If I can just jump in from a procurement standpoint, uh, three things to remember. One, uh, official communications have to be with the contracting officer, the warranted contracting officer, not the COTAR, not the core, not the program manager. And you have to keep those lines, as alluded to, to John's point, uh, clear and consistent. Um, the, the, the second thing is, is constant communication. Um, and the third thing is document, document, document. If you get a cost that might be deemed out of scope for some reason, and this pandemic is out of scope uh, on a fixed price basis that you think warrants a price adjustment, and I would err on the side of including a lot of costs because they have to be allowable under the FAR. Document everything. You not only have to document the costs that you incur, that might be an increase in cost or increase in price, uh, rather increase in cost that you should get a price adjustment for. Um, you have to document efforts to mitigate those costs. So the documentation um, at, at, a, at an early stage is, is critically important, particularly if you get into a cat fight with the agency over allowability of those costs. Yeah, Brett, we've reached the top of the hour or so, um, um, but you, we've got a whole bunch of questions in the queue. So I don't know if my fellow panelists are able to stay a little bit longer. We'd like to go through them, um, but um, if those that need to leave, understand, but uh, uh, I'd like to continue uh, kind of responding to questions uh, if, if that works for you all. Sure. Absolutely. And we'll take this opportunity to say thank you to obviously the panelists and for the participants for coming. Um, yeah, we do have more questions lined up, so I'll keep asking as long as the panelists keep answering. Um, question from John, can people use their, you, you guys love your acronyms, NIST, N-I-S-T, M-E-P to help displaced workers find other jobs? Um, move on. Um, for, uh, this is from Tabitha. Uh, for those of you who are self-employed with stay-at-home mandate, if you have to leave your home for a meeting, do you just create your own letter? This is John. This is just my sense, and I'm not a lawyer. I don't even um, play one on TV. I turn that over to uh, to Jim and Jeff, but. Um, uh, my sense is this is not martial law. These things are a civil law. Um, uh, I think they're meant to send a signal. The governor of Northam was very clear about that. You just don't want to see big crowds of people on beaches on the weekend. The, the stay at home is not meant to keep essential people from going, from conducting their work as part of the critical infrastructure protection workforce of the United States. So, um, uh, everybody's got their own style. I've seen a, a very different kinds of ones, some from customers, some from primes, some that companies who are only subcontractors do themselves. But I would just say uh, um, official paper citing the uh, DHS declaration of who's in the critical infrastructure protection workforce in the United States, which includes our entire industry, official paperwork about the program one is working on and, the, and that we're considered essential workers. It's just always good to have on you. Um, even if you're a one-person government contracting company and you're going outside of your home for a meeting, I think that's just 
prudent. Yeah, and I think John's uh, right here. This is Jerry. I, I can go back into that NIST MEP question. That's sort of a, uh, I think it's the manufacturing extension partnerships, I think, and those are regional kind of organizations that help um, uh, that help in uh, distressed, distressed areas um, run by NIST. And those are good places that, that help or, um, communities transition um, for, you know, from if one industry leaves a town, uh, helps it helps find um, retrain or find work for other folks. So, so that is a good place to look. So to address that question, you want to bring up a, a question from Christopher directly to uh, to Jeff. Uh, you said the small businesses that qualify have to demonstrate that they were impacted. However, from what the CARES legislation states under the Payroll Protection Program, it seems that all businesses would will be deemed impacted. Now, is that your understanding? And if not what would be the general test for impact or potential future impact? Oh, Jeff, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, there, so that's interesting because there, there are different standards for different situations. Um, uh, the, uh, for the small loans, uh, for the SBA program, uh, there is a requirement that the bar certify that the uncertainty of economic conditions uh, make the loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations of the recipient. In other words, without it, you couldn't maintain your operation. So uh, that is a, re a specific requirement of that. And I don't see uh, any ability of anybody to waive it. You know, as I said before, and that's why the memo we put up is very user friendly. It walks you through this. The different types of money have different obligations. The, the, the tightest, if you will, are those targeted uh, monies for the, uh, the special distress sectors, the, the airlines, national security, cargo airlines, et cetera. Uh, the second tightest, I would say, is for mid-sized companies, where also there's a list of very specific requirements, including that your neutral labor union uh, elections in the company, you have to agree to do that. The one for what I would call not mid-sized, not the targeted sectors, everyone else, uh, there's a much shorter list of requirements that doesn't include some of these things, and a few of the things can be waived, okay? And now you can ask me, why is it like that? The answer, I think, is somewhat a negotiated set of solutions here. It's not necessarily, you know, a, a rational Martian looking at it wouldn't say, well, of course, right? It's just that's how the negotiation works. Great. We've got some... Um Couple others, a uh, question from John. Uh, Jeff, you talked about the logical use of DPA uh, and it kind of brought into question, why was GM asked to produce ventilators and why more to Jerry's point, why were more specific companies not targeted? This would be to the general pan panel of why you think that route was, was, was taken by the administration. Well, so first of all, again, I applaud willing volunteers. And the way I read it, and all I know is from what I read news, is that they were partnering with a company that was essentially licensing them to use their production methodology, I think, okay? Uh, so it's not just an auto company off in space. But yes, again, my, my issue, putting that, uh, not focusing on that one situation, is if I were doing this, I would do this systemically and start with the, 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 the sector most directly affected, the ventilator sector, look at the companies literally one by one, have them give you information, figure out what you think they could do more of, maybe they don't want to do for some other reason, and then move out from there. And you move out in terms of what's the quickest time to get the things from these different companies and what's the lowest cost. Time probably is prioritized over cost today. Being able to technically do it in time uh, are the two key variables and cost probably comes in third during this kind of a crisis. That's just the way it is. You, you know, you always have three variables in government contracting and lots of times one has to give. And I would say that's the one here. But, but you know, seriously, if you start the way I'm suggesting, again, will volunteers let them come forward? That's terrific uh, in the industry. But you start at the closest in the industry and you move out from there with the nearest substitutes. Yeah, I would, uh, Jeff, uh, this is Jerry. Uh, I I think that's a, that's a good good um, a good approach. I mean, the alternate approach is I think what the administration has taken. I th you know there there is sort of an all of the above approach, which is saying, listen, we're going to take them, we're going to do prototyping on 
around the industry in different areas to try to build. We're going to try to build the uh, build up the existing production line and try to get other new entrants in and see which one works best. Um, I think the challenge with doing the, I mean, I, I believe in theory what you, your approach is good, but if you're using, it, it, building an organization or building a capability in the middle of a crisis is always hard to do. See the coalition prison authority in Iraq. So I think, you know, you know, taking an approach where you're, it's going to be chaotic no matter what you do. So, I mean, this is one way, um, way to approach it. Your way, um, maybe system, systematic, I worry about being late to need, you know, that kind of, those concerns. I understand that, you know, that, again, that there seems to be some allergy, but, you know, they have people working on it. I put together an innovation task force in a day. Yeah. I have questionnaires out to the companies in 48 hours and yep. begin to look at it one by one. I think it can be done. It can be done with dispatch. And I'm, you know, and again, I'm all for all this other stuff. Yep. And all these companies come in if they can do something useful, great. Um, but, but, you know, I think you have to do it systematically to try to get to the best solutions. We got a good question, I think, for, for both Jim and Jeff. Um, so this one's from, from John. Uh, I represent a service uh, disabled veteran owned small business that provides military readiness assessments at service level exercises as professional services. The exercises are postponed due to large gathering uh, requirements. Our company applied for an SBA loan under the CARES Act before the announcement for payroll and benefits forgiveness. Uh, do you think this will still be available? Well, I, you know, referring to the loan, it, it, it's hard to know without knowing all the specifics. But in general, the CARES Act sounds like it covers your kind of situation, where you're going to have trouble, you know, with uh, with cash flow, and because of you know the the things you do have been canceled, and you're not having money coming, and you need to maintain a workforce. Mm -hmm. And then again, it might not. I mean, that's that's where you, some of the clauses could kick in. Um, it could be a constructive termination for convenience. Uh, it could be, it could fall under the changes clause um, that you might be entitled to compensation. Again, you have to look at, you know, w without the fault or negligence of the contractor as the key issue here. Um, and, uh, you know, the, to, to, to quote one uh, uh, former uh, uh, sec def, there's a lot of unknown unknowns out there in terms of recoverability of costs. Uh, that are not covered by the CARES Act. Great, that actually got through all the uh, the questions we had in both the chat and the Q&A. Um, Great. If we want to do our, our final goodbyes, I'll turn back over to you, Jerry. Great. Hey, thanks a lot, Brett, and thanks uh, for all the audience for great participation and my fellow panelists um, for your great remarks and uh, answers. I guess one a parting question, um, a parochial, I guess, on behalf of the center is um, what, what do you think would be, what kind of metrics do you think we should be measuring um, to, um, f f during this time in the center? Because we're thinking about uh, tracking contract imp impact on contracts by the situations, but what are, what are your thoughts as practitioners we should be uh, looking at? Uh, Jerry, one, one thing, it might be hard, but I would measure um, a lost work, lost work as or if possible. Um, and uh, how to measure that's going to be a hard thing. But if you, um, how much just escaped, because what we want is, and this is going to last a couple of months, hopefully not more. What we want to do is, as a community, come out the other side of this, having learned from it in the same way we learned from and did some small corrective measures from the different government shutdowns, recognizing that the goal of keeping this community going and serving uh, uh, the needs of the government is unchanged. Mm -hmm. uh, but we change our ways of doing it based upon what we're learning. So um, one of the big uh, pieces of learning someone would want to know um, is how much got through the filters of all this stuff, CARES Acts, uh, changes in legislation, empowering contracting officers to do this or that. Even so, how much slipped through and was lost? 20% of the work, 15, eight? Uh, that'd be a really, and, and, then what, and then you can start to drill it on on when you really know what, what, what was not fixed or was unfixed 
fix a bowl by the, these actions, you start to drill on how to take care of that in the next round. Uh, let me add a, a couple things. First of all, if I was sitting in the Pentagon, what I want to know is I look down the programs that are, uh, you know, out there and have program managers in each service reporting, and, you know, over the next two months, you know, are there any critical programs where things are going behind? Uh, you know, you have to do some triage here if I'm program managers or if I'm the in charge of procurement for the government, which is what things do I care most about and am I getting them on time? Uh, and particularly with things that maybe relate to the crisis, um, number one. Number two, I do think there's sort of a, you know, in the, in the difficulty of the situation, we have a, we're running a national laboratory experiment here on everybody working from home, essentially, right? And in the defense workforce, you know, maybe there are some, perversely, some efficiencies out of this where some functions can be done remotely and you can lower overhead costs. I don't know. But I do think there's a, you know, we're running a, you know, a, um, a national laboratory experiment and, you know, uh, people doing work from home and, you know, what, does that create efficiencies? What about the cybersecurity risks that go with that? And a range of other issues. I think that's a great point. Um, listen, I, I, and it's a good, good one to wrap up on. So I want to thank you, John, Jim, Jeff, and Eric for your great um, work on this spread for hosting us. And thank you, the audience. Uh, we, we've recorded this, uh, this webinar and we're going to post it on our website, which is uh, www.govcon.gmu.edu. And we're also going to share the presentation with you all um, and after this as well. And finally, look out for updates that will be coming um, in, the, in the coming days from the center as we kind of continue to track uh, the impact of this incredibly challenging situation on, uh, on our, our respective businesses and organizations. So thanks very much for your time and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you.